Now, as I mentioned last time, the, turn, the real turning point here, as in many other things, is the Emancipation Proclamation, which for the first time officially authorizes, in the words of the President, the enlistment of black men in the Union Army as soldiers, not just as laborers and transport people, as combat soldiers, enrolling black soldiers. And immediately after the proclamation, the process of enlisting black men in the Army really gets underway. It starts in the North. One of the first units is this so-called 54th Massachusetts, and then the 55th, two units out of Massachusetts. Governor John Andrew, a radical Republican, in Massachusetts, very anxious to enlist black men. But there aren't a heck of a lot of black men in Massachusetts, tiny numbers. So in fact, the 54th Massachusetts um, recruits all over the North. They get people from New York State, up to Albany, a whole bunch went enlisted there. They get people from Ohio. There's not enough African-American men in Massachusetts to fill up these two units. But they, se they send recruiters. Frederick Douglass goes around recruiting men for, and this is a kind of recruiting poster that they use to, you know, show the, what, you, what you're going to look like if you go in the Army. Come and join us, brothers. Um, it, it, it was sometimes not that easy to get people to recruit. First of all, the Confederacy, and we'll see this in a minute, announced that captured black soldiers would not be treated as prisoners of war. They would be treated as escaped slaves and put into slavery. So, that was, not a, that was a disincentive, especially for a free person from the North. You, you, if you enlist in the Army and you're captured, you may be put into slavery. So that, that was, uh, as I say, made you think twice, maybe. Um, but Douglas insists this is a golden opportunity. Once, this is in Douglas's Monthly, his periodical at that time, once let the black man get on his person the brass letters U.S., let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket, and there is no power on earth that can deny that he has earned the right to citizenship in the United States. So this is the way to get your rights. Serve in the Army, okay? Douglas and other black abolitionists also use another kind of language in recruit, and that is, that can be summarized in his phrase, prove you are men. This is a way to prove your manhood. The manhood of African Americans has been belittled, diminished, denied. Prove that you are men by fighting in the army. This theme of African Americans having to show their manhood is a constant in African American history from this day, from that day, all the way up to Malcolm X who would talk about this, it's also used in other ways. The Moynihan Report from the 1960s, which argued that, the, that slavery had, quote unquote, destroyed black masculinity. Or even just the other day, President Obama with his uh, announcing a specific plan to um, you know, uplift young black men, uh, to programs to get them jobs and everything, which is fine. They should have jobs. But all of this kind of leaves women out in the lurch. Strong women are seen as a threat to black manhood. The Moynihan Report said the problem with the black community is that women have too much strength and men don't have enough and the government should intervene to uplift. So you, but you can see this, this is not exactly what Douglas is saying, but this notion of proving your manhood is a theme that runs all the way through the African American experience. And Again, it's, uh, whites don't have to prove their manhood somehow. Um, th this is just part of the sort of ra baggage of racism uh, from slavery. Well, anyway, um, the 54th Massachusetts, which finally enlisted about 1,000 men under the command of the Boston abolitionist Robert Gould Shaw. Robert Gould Shaw, they had departure from Boston in 1863, and it was, it was a major event. They paraded down to the dock. There was a great, you know, civic celebration to send them on their way. Um, in July, they took part in this attack on an entrenched Confederate position in South Carolina called Fort Wagner. And um, it was a disaster, in a sense, that uh, of 600 men attacking Fort Wagner, 
in, from the 54th, there were people from other units too, uh, 250 were killed, which is an incredibly high death rate, including Robert Gould Shaw, who was killed, uh, you know, leading the charge against this fort. And normally, the, the dead would be buried where they were, but the officers' bodies would be returned to the other side. But the Confederates said Shaw is not an officer because blacks are not soldiers, so they just threw him in a mass grave, his body, with the, uh, with the rest of the soldiers. Um, so the, but the, the, the Fort Wagner was a defeat, but it disproved many of the mythologies of black soldiers. They did not run away. They showed great courage. They, they kept moving forward and fighting in a very difficult situation until told to retreat. And uh, as I say, the St. Gordon's Memorial on Boston Common is a you know, memorial to this, although, and this is my problem with the movie Glory, I hate to be always criticizing Hollywood, it's really about Robert Gould Shaw. The, 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 and, and it's the Robert Gould Shaw Memorial in, on Boston Common, although it has a lot of images of his soldiers. Um, but certainly the movie, which did I think a very good job of alerting, of educating people about the fact that black soldiers did fight in the Civil War. Um, it's really, I don't know if people have seen it, it's really no different than what they used to, some people are old enough here to remember Audie Murphy movies from about World War II, you know, where a young jerk goes into the army and becomes a man, that's the theme, and over and over again. So that's what happened to Robert Gould Shaw. He goes in the army, he's a kind of young fly-by-night guy, and he becomes a real man and then he's killed. But the, the black soldiers are kind of the background, so to speak, to the change in Robert Gould Shaw. That's my view of the movie anyway. They're not really the center of the movie, even though it's about their unit. But anyway, Rick, I'm not a movie critic, so if you disagree with me, cool. Um, <laughs> here's another, um, this is another famous photograph of a black unit, Company E, all lined up with their rifles. Um, let's, uh, oh, here we go. These are just, just like, just like white soldiers, they posed for these cartes de visite before going off into the army. I showed you some of those of the white. Here's one carte de visite of a, uh, of a, a black, um, of a black soldier. Let's see if I can find, uh, here's another one, a guy, he's actually a sergeant, I believe, from the stripes on his, uh, on his sleeve here, and he's holding a revolver in his hand. And one more, uh, let's see here, we can find, uh, here we go, the black artillery unit. Here's a black unit operating a cannon uh, in the Civil War. So, um, now most, the vast majority of African Americans, of course, resided in the South, and that's where the real recruiting took place. In the, once the Union Army captured Vicksburg, in July 1863, the whole Mississippi Valley, basically with major plantation area, fell into the hands of the Union, and there tens of thousands of, uh, uh, of African-American men were recruited into the Army, or more than recruited. Sometimes they were just grabbed off the plantations and told, you're in the Army now. General Lorenzo Thomas was sent by uh, Secretary War Stanton to oversee recruiting black men, and he raised 75,000 troops by 1864. Uh, uh, he was given a lot of aid by General Grant, who was in command out there. This is one of the differences between Grant and McClellan. They understood the role of the soldier in a democratic society. Remember when Lincoln issues the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, McClellan basically tells people, go out and vote against the Republicans because this is bad. Grant says, what I think about black soldiers is immaterial. This is now the policy of the government. It is my job to enforce that policy. He tells his subordinate you know, officers, Anyone here who doesn't like having black soldiers in the army resign tomorrow because this is now the policy of the government. Moreover, they're going to be in the army. They have to be treated like anybody else. They have to be protected. There cannot be any abuse of them. And it's the job of officers to make sure. So Grant said, this is now the policy, and I have to uh, enforce it. And he's in charge of those units in the Mississippi Valley. And in the Mississippi Valley, um, 
blacks do begin taking part in, in, in combat. Let me, let me see where we can, uh, wait, I'm just trying to find, uh, here we go. Uh, this is uh, Milliken's Bend. This is in the Mississippi, in, in the Mississippi Valley. This is a, just a lithograph of the Battle of Milliken's Bend where a lot of black soldiers fought um, in, uh, I can't remember if this is Mississippi or Louisiana, but whatever. Uh, and in fact, uh, I visited that site once and there's a whole cemetery of uh, uh, soldiers who fought there, including uh, African Americans. And on, on the gravestones, what they say, there's these initials, USCT, US Colored Troops. These were the first soldiers raised directly by the federal government. They were not Mississippi troops, they were not, uh, they were United States troops. These are the only units called U.S. soldiers, because as I said, all the other ones are raised through, um, you know, through, uh, through the states. But when you're in Mississippi and Louisiana, the state is not raising black troops for you. So the federal government is doing it themselves.